on World News Tonight. Russian Roulette. Russia is upping the ante with airstrikes demolishing more landmarks of Ukraine. Military power continues to flood the country as troops anticipate even stronger attacks from each side. Continuing crisis. Ukrainians pack their lives into a suitcase and move onwards, desperately seeking shelter of any form including underground as shelling consumes what used to be their homes. Will a global solution create a safe haven for refugees? Find out tonight. Conquering COVID. Despite all chaos going on in the world, it seems efforts at fighting the pandemic have yielded favorable results as over half the world is now equipped with all jabs, as well as cases continue to decline steeply. And drone displays. South Korea pays tribute to Ukraine in a series of magnificent patterns etched into the night sky. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with increasing tensions of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mass destruction ensured as the mayor of Kharkiv says Russian forces are now surrounded in the city. Its police headquarters was left in flames after a missile attack. Ukrainian authorities say around 2,000 civilians have been killed in the past week. Russia's offensive tonight is growing more indiscriminate and destructive, raining down on Ukrainian towns and cities. This is the aftermath of a missile attack on the police headquarters in Kharkiv, a besieged eastern city about the size of Philadelphia. The city is surrounded. The mayor says there's been massive destruction. The UN says nearly 230 Ukrainian civilians have been killed so far. The number could be much higher. Just outside the capital, Russia attacked a residential neighborhood. Rescuers scrambled to search for survivors. Yesterday, Russia attacked Kiev's television tower. It's right next to the city's historic Babinyar Holocaust Memorial. Russia claims its goal now is to overthrow Ukraine's government, calling it a new Nazi regime. Ukraine's Jewish president Zelensky accused Russia of distorting history and called on Jews around the world to come to the nation's defense. Zelensky tweeting, what is the point of saying never again if the world stays silent when a bomb drops on the same site of Babinyar? Tonight, a senior U.S. defense official says while Russia has increased missile and artillery attacks on the capital, a convoy heading toward the city is still stalled but that Russian forces advancing from the south are making progress. The Kremlin insists tough sanctions imposed by President Biden and the West, isolating its banks and oligarchs, though allowing Russia to keep selling its oil and gas will not deter Russia's so-called special military action. But every day, more brave Ukrainians, many without weapons, are standing up to Russian occupiers. This crowd confronting Russian troops in Berdyansk and south of Kiev, stopping a convoy of Russian vehicles. A Russian soldier showing restraint fires into the air. He seems not to know how to respond. Russian troops were told they'd be greeted as liberators, freeing Ukraine from a hated radical government. But that's not the response they're seeing now. While hope for a compromise seems to be dwindling gradually, it seems that efforts are still persisting to keep whatever peace remains between the two countries in the form of talks. The second round of talks are to focus on key issues of the invasion. Let's cross over to other than world news special correspondent, Malsha Patiraja, who joins us now from Kursk in Russia. For more, Malsha. Yes, Shanali. Russian presidential aide Vladimir Medinsky said the head of the Russian delegation has arrived for the second round of talks between Russia and Ukraine. Russia's RIA Novosti News Agency reported citing officials that the delegation arrived at Belarushskaya Pushcha on the Belarus-Poland border. Medinsky said the Ukrainian side is on its way and is expected to arrive soon. The two sides are expected to agree on the meeting place for the talks. The two sides are expected to discuss the possibility of a ceasefire and the establishment of a humanitarian corridor. Russia and the Ukraine concluded their first round of negotiations in Belarus with no clear breakthrough. 
As delegations continued, satellite images released by Maxa showed the detailed impact on Ukraine of Russia's military invasion. Heavy cloud cover over the Ukraine has prevented Maxa from publishing new images, causing them to instead closely inspect the high-resolution imagery taken by three satellites in the preceding days. Back to you, Shenali. Thank you. And that was other than a World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. As Russia's military strikes continue on Ukraine's capital, residents who have not left the city are spending nights in subway stations and underground shelters. They are also struggling to get food and basic supplies, and supermarkets are running out. As Russia continues its attack on Kyiv, residents have been spending the night in subway stations. Others have been sleeping in makeshift bomb shelters, such as underground car parks or in their basements. The city's officials had issued warnings that residents should seek shelter and take precautions to avoid flying debris and bullets. Still, residents are making the best of the situation as war rages above ground. According to Deutsche Welle, the city authorities extended the nighttime curfew on Tuesday. Instead of the 10 p.m. curfew, it now begins at 8 p.m. and lasts until 8 a.m. the next morning. People have been going to shelters before the curfew starts, and when the curfew ends, they rush back home to replenish their supplies. To buy food, they have to wait in extremely long lines in supermarkets. And already, there is a shortage of medicine, bread, and other basic food in the city. The city officials have said that they would deliver food to local stores, but Deutsche Welle reported on Wednesday that there was no bread, fresh fruit, or vegetables. It said that in many supermarkets, the only products available were cakes, pastries, tobacco, and alcohol. In a display of unity across the board, the UNGA has voted in favor of reprimanding Russia for its invasive actions. The assembly demanded that Russia put an end to the offensive efforts in Ukraine. Today we call on Russia to stop its unprovoked, unjustified, unconscionable war. In an historic meeting, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly voted to reprimand Russia for invading Ukraine and demanded that Moscow stop fighting and withdraw its military forces. The General Assembly has spoken. The resolution Wednesday was supported by 141 of the Assembly's 193 members and passed in a rare emergency session called by the UN Security Council. As Ukrainian forces battle to defend itself in the face of a Russian invasion that has forced hundreds of thousands to flee. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. First of all, to put the, the vote in the UN um, in perspective, um, it is both overwhelming and I would even say historic. Uh, go back to 2014 when the uh, General Assembly pronounced itself on Russia's initial aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, the votes in favor of that resolution uh, were 100. The last time the Security Council convened an emergency session of the General Assembly was in 1982. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield called it an extraordinary moment and urged members to hold Moscow accountable for its violations of international law. If the United Nations has any purpose, it is to prevent war. It is to condemn war, to stop war. That is our job here today. It is the job you were sent here to do, not just by your capitals, but by all of humanity. She accused Russia of using weapons that violate international laws, including cluster munitions and vacuum bombs. Russia's UN envoy denied Moscow was targeting civilians and accused Western governments of pressuring assembly members to pass the resolution. Russia was joined by Belarus, which has served as a launch pad for Russian invasion forces, Eritrea, North Korea and Syria in voting against the resolution. 35 members abstained, including China. The International Sporting Committee is also joining efforts to condemn the, and isolate Moscow. Russian teams and athletes are facing exclusive from mayor competitions, including the World Cup. In line with international efforts to isolate Russia from the global economy with biting sanctions, the sports community is stepping up efforts to sideline Russia and its ally Belarus from the playing field. The International Olympic Committee was the first to make a move. In a statement released on Monday, the IOC advised sports bodies to bar the participation of Russian and Belarusian athletes and officials on top of its recommendation against holding any sporting events in the two countries. 
The IOC also decided to withdraw the Olympic order given to Russian President Vladimir Putin in 2001, citing his, quote, extremely grave violation of the Olympic truce. The situation is no different in football. The sports world governing body, FIFA, announced a joint decision with UEFA on Tuesday that it is suspending all Russian national and club teams from both FIFA and UEFA competitions until further notice. This means no World Cup for Russia's national team and club side Spartak Moscow has been expelled from the UEFA Europa League. The team had been due to face RB Leipzig in the round of 16 on March 10th. The series of sports sanctions prompted sharp criticism from Moscow. Our country has always adhered to the principle that sport is beyond politics. But we are constantly drawn into the politics because they understand the importance of sport in the lives of our Russian people. Yet regardless of Russia's response, global sports bodies are ratcheting up their backlash against Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. In line with the IOC, a growing number of international sports federations, including those of skating, basketball, track and field, skiing, rugby and tennis, have excluded Russian players as of Wednesday. Gymnastics, judo and volleyball matches slated to take place in Russia have been cancelled as well. French President Emmanuel Macron pledged to increase France's defense spending and call for a more sovereign and independent Europe to counter what he said is a new era signaled by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. To get more details on this, we have Abhidhar and World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. Mr. Macron said in a televised national address that Europe must now accept the price for peace, freedom and democracy and that the bloc must invest more to depend less on other continents and to be able to decide for itself. In other words, to become a more independent, more sovereign power. Mr. Macron said France will hold a meeting with other European leaders in Versailles near Paris on March 10th and 11th. He firmly stated that European defense must take a new step forward. Mr. Macron also denounced what he said were lies spread by the Russian government to justify war in Ukraine and said he will pursue effort to reach a ceasefire. He affirmed that this war is not a conflict between the West and Russia, as some would like to believe. He also confirmed that there is no NATO base in Ukraine, denouncing them as lies. This war is not a fight against Nazism, he added. The war will in inevitably have an impact on France's economic growth, its industrial, agricultural sectors and French people's purchasing power. Mr. Macron said he added that he asked his Prime Minister to work on resilience plan to support the economy. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Adharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. In the global effort to isolate Russia from the rest of the world, Boeing, Europe's airplane giant, is also pulling out from the country, pausing parts of manufacturing and maintenance projects, causing Russia even more financially loss. Boeing is the latest company to cut ties with Russia following its invasion of Ukraine. The American airplane manufacturer said late Tuesday that it was suspending parts, maintenance and technical support for Russian airlines. The United States said it would follow the European Union and Canada in banning Russian flights from its airspace. Boeing's announcement came as aircraft and engine manufacturers, lessers and maintenance repair and overhaul providers with Russian clients face a raft of EU and US bans. There are also potential payment difficulties after some Russian banks were banned from the SWIFT payment system. The new sanctions isolate Russia's aviation sector in a similar way to Iran and North Korea, but will have much larger consequences given the bigger size of the Russian market. Russia accounted for around 6% of global air traffic capacity in 2021, according to aviation consulting firm IBA. The country's airlines will also be barred from taking new aircraft on order from Western manufacturers. 
Boeing said it would stop all major operations in the country, where it also has a technical research centre and its largest engineering centre for computer-rated aerostructure design outside of the US. European rival Airbus said Wednesday it too had stopped sending parts to Russia and was no longer supporting the country's airlines. However, it said it was still analysing whether its Moscow engineering centre could keep providing services to local customers. However, Russia is causing economic losses to the rest of the world as well. The country's conflict has caused global oil prices to rise, the value now breezing past $110 as the shortage cautions dealers to look for alternatives. The conflict in Ukraine has global oil markets in deepening turmoil. As fighting appeared to escalate, crude prices soared past $110 per barrel. At one point Wednesday, they hit highs not seen since mid-2014. The surge comes as traders seek alternatives to Russian oil. It normally accounts for about 8% of global supply. Now Western powers are yet to put any direct sanctions on the country's energy exports. But traders in New York and elsewhere say they are shunning Russian oil. Energy trade has also been complicated by sanctions on Russian banks. Finding alternative sources won't be easy, though, as supplies of crude were already tight even before the Ukraine crisis. The International Energy Agency says commercial oil stockpiles are at their lowest since 2014. It coordinated an emergency release of national reserves on Tuesday in a bid to cap price rises. Now OPEC may also help a bit. The oil producers group is expected to increase supply by 400,000 barrels per day. The world may be facing chaos, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel as global uh, new COVID-19 cases and deaths continue to decline by 16% and 10% respectively over the week. Along with this, 56% of the world have been fully vaccinated. Across the six WHO regions, over 10 million new cases and over 60,000 new deaths were reported during the week. However, the Western Pacific region was also the only region to report weekly case growth, a rise of about 32%. The Western Mediterranean region recorded a drop of about 34%, the biggest decrease across the six WHO regions. Around 56% of the world's population has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. But the inoculation rate remained far lower in low-income countries, the World Health Organization chief warned. At a press briefing in Geneva, WHO director Tedros Adenom said that many countries are still battling with high rates of hospitalization and deaths, as well as low rates of vaccination coverage. Only 9% of the population of low-income countries have been fully vaccinated. He said the agency is still overcoming many of the supply and delivery constraints it faced last year, with more than 1.3 billion doses of vaccine delivery by COVAX, and the supply outlook for this year is positive. Sudan is on the verge of collapse following the coup takeover. The country's economy is continuously declining due to sanctions on the militia and healthcare is in critical condition across the nation. Sudan is once again lurching towards an economic collapse following a coup in October, with exports plummeting more than 85% in January, according to central bank data. Cut off from billions in foreign assistance, the military-led government is raising prices for everything from cooking gas to health care. Last month, in a move that was subsequently suspended, the cost of admission to healthcare facilities went from 250 Sudanese pounds, or around half a US dollar, to 4,200 overnight. That's according to Dr Ali Shakir, head of one of the country's largest public hospitals. Sudan's ruling council said in a statement that prices would be reviewed and that the government did not consider health care a revenue earner. But the country faces a precarious economic picture. Inflation has eased slightly but remains at one of the highest rates worldwide at 260 per cent in January. Sudan's long-running economic crisis, a legacy of decades of war, isolation and sanctions, had shown signs of abating before the coup. But now the population faces renewed violence and rising levels of hunger. 
Following the devaluation of Sudan's currency a year ago, the exchange rate had stabilised at about £450 to the dollar. But in recent weeks, the black market has resurfaced and the pound was changing hands at 530 against the dollar on Wednesday, compared with an official rate of 443.50. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Millions of people in South Korea got to watch the country's four main presidential candidates to go head-to-head -head one last time in the last televised debate before the March 9th election. The candidates exchanged verbal baths over a variety of societal issues facing South Korea. Over in Syria, 11 people have reportedly been killed and seven others injured after a fire broke out at a shopping mall located in the capital. The fire ravaged the La Merida Mall in Hamra Street, one of the most famous marketplaces in the capital. Russian businessman Roman Abramovich announced that he has decided to sell this Chelsea football club 19 years after purchasing the London side. But he's also promised to donate money from the sale to help victims of the war in Ukraine, as he told his aides to set up a charitable foundation which would receive all net proceeds from the sale. The US military said it will postpone a scheduled test launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile in a bid to lower soaring tensions after Russia announced it was putting its nuclear forces to high alert. Putin's foreign minister was quoted warning that a third world war would be a nuclear conflict, remarks that added a growing unease. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with South Korea's dazzling dawn display in support of Ukraine. Thank you for watching. Good night.